We all know that um, insects are important pollinators, but today we want to talk about just what that process is and uh, the mechanisms that allow for pollination to happen and why it's so important. This actually, this presentation actually came about as a result of uh, our participants' feedback. Uh, the feedback of people just like you when uh, Lara and Shannon asked for ideas for future webinars. Uh, this topic came up and apparently people want to know about Florida's native pollinators, including hummingbirds, butterflies, and the rest. So uh, this is, uh, today's presentation is down to you all. The objectives and the kind of uh, way that we've put today's presentation together uh, is to first understand what pollination is and then look at some of plants' pollination mechanisms. I'm a botanist by trade and so I tend to look at most things from a plant's point of view. And then we'll look at some of the species of uh, pollinators that are native here in Florida. But first we have a poll question and Lara is going to uh, get you to answer this quick question for us. Which of the following are important in Florida? And you can select all that you think apply. We've got hummingbirds, bees, wasps, slugs, bats, flies, and mosquitoes. So go ahead and click all that you think apply. And once a lot of people have, once a majority of people have answered, we'll go ahead and publish that, um, uh, the response that uh, the group has today. And while you're selecting, I just wanted to say thank you to Lara and Shannon for giving me the opportunity to present this topic today. All right, it looks like everyone, almost everyone selected hummingbirds. Everyone knows that bees are important. Wasps are actually effective pollinators as well. Believe it or not, there are some flowers that are slug pollinated, mollusks. Uh, bats are important pollinators for a couple of species of cactus in the desert southwest, but not here in Florida. Flies make up a majority of pollinators, and even mosquitoes. The male mosquito uh, does not feed on blood. He feeds on nectar, and in so doing, uh, pollinates certain species. So well done, everyone, and we can go ahead and close that, and we'll carry on. So what is pollination? Now, I'm going to use some botanical terms here, but I know you guys, you can handle this. We're all, we're all scientists today, right? And um, the pollination is the transfer of the pollen from the anther of one plant to the stigma of another plant. Um, what happens next is pretty magical. Little pollen grains, they're like tiny, tiny, tiny little, little particles. They actually germinate and begin to grow down through the plant's reproductive system until they find an egg cell that they uh, fertilize. And that egg develops into a seed. And that, folks, is the birds and the bees. That's how plants reproduce. Um, and it's important for plants to transfer their pollen from one individual to a different individual uh, for outbreeding purposes. And I'm sure you understand that. So plants need that pollen to be transferred in order for their seeds to develop to reproduce themselves. Let's look at that in real life. This is a cherry blossom that's been cut uh, longitudinally. And you can see the anthers are out here uh, on the tips of these long filaments. And they're out there to brush up against the pollinators that are visiting uh, the flower. This central spot in the center of the flower is where that pollen is, is uh, transferred to the other plant. And then the pollen, as I mentioned, grows down through this structure and into the ovary where it pollinates uh, I'm sorry, it fertilizes the egg cells which develop into seeds. Once pollination has taken place, all the superfluous bits of the flower fall away, like the petals and the anthers, their, their job is done. And the ovary begins to swell as the seeds inside develop. Ovary also provides nutritious, uh, nutrition for the developing seed and eventually nutrition for um, a frugivore or a fruit eater who will consume the fruit and poop out the seed in a faraway place with a little bit of fertilizer um, wrapped up in a little bit of fertilizer for it. So that's how, uh, that's why pollination is important for plants. It helps them get around. And it's important for us, of course, because without uh, pollinators, we wouldn't have a lot of our foods. And agriculture is very, very tied in with pollinators. Um, 
And these, uh, these photographs represent some of Texas native pollinators. Um, you notice the honey, the European honeybee isn't here because the European honeybee is, guess what? Not from here. So what's in it for the pollinator? I mean, great, great news for the plant that it gets to reproduce, but what's in it for the pollinator? And you probably know that the reward is nectar. And flowers that are pollinated uh, by these insects that are nectar seeking, they produce nectar uh, in, in certain quantities over and over again. And a, a plant can uh, recharge its nectar store. And the pollinators can tell if there's any nectar in a flower by the scent that a previous pollinator may have left behind. So today, as mentioned, we'll look at hummingbirds, butterflies, and the rest. So we'll start with hummingbirds. And I've put hummingbird uh, parentheses S because there's just one species of hummingbird that's found regularly here in Florida, and that's the ruby throat. And we all know that, uh, or we all believe that uh, hummingbirds are attracted to the color red. Um, they're also attracted to the color purple, blue, yellow, green, orange, pink. As long as there's a tubular flower that's promising a nectar reward, the hummingbirds will be attracted to it. They can, however, associate certain colors with reward. And that is a syndrome that allows plants to be pollinated uh, with a, with a bird, in this case, going from the same species to another, because this particular individual knows that this red tubular flower is gonna give her a nice, a nice drink, so she'll fly to another member of the same species and transfer the pollen. Here's a couple of mechanisms that uh, flowers use to uh, get their pollen onto a hummingbird. In this case, uh, these are all tubular red flowers. In this case, the pollen is deposited on her chinny chin chin. This one gets it on the face, uh, here's some that uh, the pollen collects on the beak and even on the top of the head. So the stigmatic or the stigma uh, of the same species of this plant is going to receive pollen off the top of that hummingbird's head. Our native hummingbird is the ruby-throated, and it's so called because it has the males have this uh, brilliant flash of uh, red-orange on their chin. And they love some of our native plants like the firebush, uh, arguably native plants like the firebush and the coral honeysuckle. So those are tubular flowers just right for these pollinators uh, who, when they pass through, become effective pollinators for these plants. However, like I mentioned before, uh, we're not at up with hummingbirds here in Florida like other states are. What's really cool is uh, a hummingbird look-alike. It's the hummingbird clear wing moth. And this could confuse you. If you see it flying around, you may have thought that you saw a hummingbird. And I've got a quick video here to show you of the hummingbird clear wing moth in action on a butterfly bush. You can see the little moth hovering. Yes, a little bit. And the photographer. I think they're called hummingbird clear wings. Got it right on the head. It's a hummingbird clear wing moth. So be on the lookout for those. They're not particular to flower type, uh, but they do tend to lay their eggs on plants like viburnum. Now the butterflies. Everybody loves butterflies. So we have a poll question about this. Uh, I believe this one is a true or false question. Butterflies are important pollinators. Save the butterfly. We have a lot more tolerance for butterflies than we do of their larvae, however, the caterpillars. People tend to want to get rid of caterpillars, uh, not realizing that you can't have butterflies without caterpillars. Um, so we'll have true, 83% say that uh, butterflies are important pollinators, 17% uh, false. And here's the deal, gang. Uh, pollinators, uh, butterflies are actually about 20% effective as pollinators. They just aren't built to carry pollen. So we give uh, the butterflies a, a thumbs down and the poll results that we just saw uh, are kind of indicative that most people believe, and we have previously for, from years past believed that butterflies were important pollinators. An interesting study done in Sweden uh, in, in the 
uh, recently, uh, they collected a bunch of butterflies out of a meadow, many, many different species, and they found very, very few even pollen grains attached to those butterflies. So they're just not effective at moving pollen from plant to plant, but they sure do enjoy the nectar. The Hymenoptera is a family of insects that's very, very diverse. It includes all the stingers, it can, uh, the honeybees, the ants, the hornets, the wasps, all these sorts of things. And they have kind of moved in uh, and evolved with a lot of the flowering plants to become uh, probably the most, uh, within the families of insects, the most important. Uh, so let's look at a few plants, pollination syndromes. What do they, how do they present their flowers and how do they present their uh, pollen bearing structures to facilitate this important process? One is to keep the flower open. And here we have uh, a wasp of, I believe it's, I'm not actually, I'm not, a scaliaed wasp, I believe, and it's visiting here a compass plant. And compass plant is in the aster family. Uh, and each of those little tubes that you can see down, especially in this flower, uh, this inflorescence here, each of those little tubes is a separate flower. So she's visiting flower after flower after flower on this one stage, uh, collecting nectar for herself and for her offspring, and um, dispersing, dispensing pollen as she travels from flower to flower. Now that open flower could be dish or bowl shaped as in our pine barren frostweed where the pollinator simply has to land and just by default is going to get covered in that uh, dusty pollen. They might be bell shaped or funnel shaped. Uh, this is wild petunia and you can see those little pollen bearing structures here along the edge of that bell. It's actually being visited here by a, an immature katydid um, who is a, a herbivore who's not, um, I don't believe interested in any of the nectar. It just happened to land on this. Maybe it's uh, there for a bite. Flowers can be brush shaped. Uh, and in this case, this is the red maple. And look, it doesn't invest very much into its petals. It's not a very showy flower. Uh, what it does is just produce nectar and it sticks its, uh, its uh, pollen bearing structures uh, out to uh, sweep across uh, the visiting, the visiting uh, nectaring uh, organism. You might know the sunshine mimosa, the sensitive plant. This is another example of a brush shaped flower. This one uh, barely has any petals at all. All you see here are the pink filaments of those pollen bearing structures. So it's done away with all the other flower parts that are used to attract pollinators. Uh, just that nectar that's uh, down here inside this inflorescence of tiny little flowers with their showy stamens. Flower, this is kind of a, a funny word, gullet shaped, like throat shaped, where the po visiting pollinator, and look, the violet even gives it a little uh, landing strip uh, with, with arrows pointing to where, to where that uh, nectar reward might be. So the animal actually has to crawl down into this gullet, uh, way into the back where there's a spur uh, where the uh, nectar is secreted. And in so doing, it brushes across the pollen bearing structures. Uh, Tube-shaped flowers, we saw some earlier, the coral honeysuckle and the firebush, uh, but there's an orchid that produces a reddish tube-shaped flower, so it's going to attract the same pollinators, uh, perhaps a hummingbird. Um, also, uh, orchids are, are often visited by moths. Uh, some orchids are fragrant, and moths are very good at uh, detecting chemicals, and that fragrance might be for, uh, for moths. So tube-shaped flowers, and, and we saw before, um, the same thing can happen to uh, any creature that sticks its uh, face into a tube-shaped flower. It's gonna get pollen deposited uh, on some part of its body. Uh, flowers that are not open, but are opened by their visitors include this iris. And again, we have a landing strip here. Uh, this iris has three flowers, one here, one here, and one here. And the landing strip with the arrows, the, the visitor actually has to crawl and open this flower to get to the back. Same is true for certain members of the bean family where the reproductive structures are inside a little pouch that two of the petals have created um, under here and to get to the nectar and therefore to get to uh, the pollen, 
and the stigma, the visitor actually has to open the flower uh, with force. The milk, uh, the butterfly pea, excuse me, is another example of that, where in this case, the flower is kind of upside down and the pollinator goes up and into this chamber uh, to get the nectar reward and has to actually physically open the flower himself. Now, I did mention a little bit before about how hummingbirds can associate uh, a color with a particular reward. Um, many creatures, including ourselves, uh, can create what's called a search image, uh, where we put uh, an image in our brain that uh, kind of reminds us of a positive reward. Now, with insects, that can be learned or it can be ingrained. Um, take the example of a fast food restaurant. You might have a favorite fast food restaurant, and you know that even when you travel, if you go to that particular fast food restaurant, you know exactly what kind of reward at what price uh, you're going to get. Well, it's the same with insects. Um, when insects are born, uh, they go and or when they hatch um, when they first set off to find nectar and just might happen upon a particular flower uh, get that reward they're going to remember that shape uh, and place and size and and they're very likely to visit a member of the same species just like you would visit your favorite fast food place other insects are born with a search image already in their brain. And so they are born looking for one particular species of plant. And that has benefits for both the pollinator and for the plant. Uh, the pollinator is going to know that it's looking for a particular reward. And the plant knows that that pollinator is only going to visit members of its own species. There's a little bit of a problem with that uh, in that if something happens to one of the other one of the members of that, uh, maybe a late freeze would knock the flowers out so there's no food for the pollinator or something could happen to the pollinator population, uh, which would affect the plant. Um, so it's, it's effective, but it's kind of tenuous. Um, in Florida, we have a, a bee that specializes, uh, is born looking for prickly pear cactus. We have two bees that uh, are born looking for pond lilies. And we have a species of bee that looks for nothing more than gallberry. That's just a few examples of uh, host specific relationships. So now let's look at some of the plants and the pollinators associated with them. Here is the European honeybee, honeybee, Apis mellifera. Mellifera means honey bearing. And here it's nectaring on wild coffee, one of our native plants, Psychotria nervosa. Most plants, uh, like I was saying before, uh, they, don't, they don't mind who gets their pollen as long as whomever gets their pollen is rewarded enough to visit uh, members of their, of their own species. So let's have another poll question about the honeybee. So Lara's going to launch uh, a poll and uh, we'll wait for you to answer. So without European honeybee pollination, uh, where, what would be the decrease in the amount of food that we would be able to get? Would it be a 10% decrease, a 30% decrease, uh, by half or by three quarters? So what do you think? Without European honeybees, how dependent are our food crops on their presence? And while you're answering, I'm gonna get a little drink of water. And we've got, we've got uh, quite a number of guests today. We're really glad that you're here. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. We, okay, everybody realizes that honeybees are pretty important, so nobody voted for 10%. 30% voted for I mean, 26 for 30, 32 for 50, and 42 for 75. The correct answer is 30%. So they are important, but they're not 100% critical. Our native honeybees, our native, excuse me, our native bees uh, are just as effective pollinators. But honeybees are still an important agricultural endeavor. Um, and here we have a happy guy from UF, uh, obviously delighted uh, by the state of uh, his honeybees. Um, the honeybees, of course, produce a crop, which is honey, but they also can be transported. Honeybee colonies can be transported into orchards and fields uh, to kind of guarantee a certain density of pollinators. Now, raise your hand if you know what flower this is. I'm just curious. 
If you can raise your hand. See if anybody knows what this flower is. This is the orange blossom. So that is a very important crop, although it's uh, kind of in a little bit of trouble right now with a, with a disease. But of course, honeybees, uh, an important pollinator for a major crop in Florida. But honey itself is a, a multi-million dollar industry in Florida as well. So the production of honey by these bees um, is for their own nutrition and where these bees evolved um, in Europe, um, they need the honey to overwinter. Of course, that's not a problem here, but that's why these bees store up so much honey because they need the energy to survive through the winter. Uh, our native bees have uh, seasonal cycles, but they don't, we don't have any um, hive type bees that are native to Florida. They don't, we don't have those same kind of um, issues of, of overwintering and living from year to year to find the need to produce that honey. So let's look at some of our natives. This is one of our cutest, well, arguably, uh, of our native bees. This is the little leaf cutter bee. And we have a local common name for this bee here at Brooker Creek Preserve, where I'm uh, speaking to you today from in Tarpon Springs, Florida. Uh, we call this the diaper bee. Uh, it has these hairs on the underside of its abdomen that get loaded out, down with pollen. And it looks like this bee uh, flying around with his butt in the air, with, uh, loaded down with his big heavy diaper of pollen. You can see the characteristic stinger uh, and certain bees, uh, of course, will defend a colony. Uh, they might not necessarily be aggressive when they're feeding or foraging. Uh, some bees, uh, when they sting, including the European honeybee, when it stings, uh, the sting gland that the, the venom where the venom is produced is actually removed from the bee and continues to sting uh, the aggressor, uh, which is kind of an insurance that that aggressor isn't going to try that again. Um, it does, however, kill the bee. Other species of bee, bees can sting over and over and over again when they're defending their, their nest, their colony, um, without losing that uh, gland. They're called leaf cutter bees because guess what they do? I don't need you to raise your hand. They cut leaves and they cut leaves into very distinctive shapes. It's almost like somebody came along with a hole punch um, and took the sections out of the, of the edges of leaves. And what they do with that is they take them back to a, um, a hole in a tree or uh, some other kind of uh, hole that's been, been made, and they line that hole with little bits of leaf. And that creates a nice bed for their larva to grow up in. Uh, most bees feed their larva pollen. And so that's the reason that they're collecting pollen. Um, and they collect pollen in what's called little baskets on their hind legs. And you can see uh, this little sweat bee has got a pollen basket that's loaded down. Uh, however, they're also uh, very, very fuzzy bees are. And you can see there's even pollen stuck to her, her abdomen here. So although she's collecting pollen to feed the larva back at the nest, she's also kind of inadvertently transferring pollen from one plant to another. So it's not the pollinator's objective to pollinate, it's just what ends up happening. Uh, this is one of the what's called uh, sweat bees or halictid bees. Uh, these are very small bees. If you're familiar with Coreopsis, it's, uh, the flower's only about an inch or an inch and a half across. You can see compared to a honeybee, this is a very tiny little thing. Uh, I'm quite fond of the halictid bees. They come in all shapes and sizes and colors, including uh, this metallic green. And I'm always on the lookout for the metallic green halictid bees. They're small and they're interesting. Um, I've been known to kind of crawl around in the grass uh, on pond sides looking for little pollinators and have actually been offered drugs. But I didn't need them because I was having quite enough uh, fun enough time looking for the little bees. Here's a female a uh, green metallic bee, uh, she puts her uh, nest underground and here's her big fat larva. And you can see the little bundles of pollen that she has adhered to the inside of that burrow where the, where the larva is growing up and the larva can just kind of reach up and get a mouthful of, of, of pollen uh, to feed itself. 
So those are the little helictid bees. They're many shaped. Like I said, there's many shapes and sizes, but they're mostly little small, very active bees and kind of hard to photograph because they're really, really busy. Looking very similar to a familiar bee, looking similar to the bumblebee, this is the carpenter bee, and it's so-called because it can actually uh, drill holes. It drills holes in wood. Uh, it can kind of be uh, kind of surprising to see these bees uh, burrowing into the timbers of a home. They can't do any significant damage like a... Um, like a termite can, but what they could do is create the hole that can then be improved or embellished upon by a woodpecker. Uh, it could be a point of entry for moisture that could start to decompose the wood. So sometimes these are treated as pests, but their natural habitat is to go into dead trees, drill into dead trees, and, and they have the same sort of um, syndrome of lining that tube with pollen grains to feed their larva, just like the little helictid bee does. The carpenter bee can be distinguished from the bumblebee by its gigantic head. And it's got that gigantic head because it needs a lot of musculature in order to chew through wood. There are the large carpenter bee and the small carpenter bee. And the males don't have any sting whatsoever, but they sure do want you to think they do. And when there's a burrow or a, a borehole, uh, the male will get right up in your face. And these are large bees. And, um, He'll really try and scare you off, but he's not got uh, any sting whatsoever. The bumblebee, this is a very familiar bee, and we all know that bumblebees, well, maybe we don't. Uh, bumblebees are not aggressive bees unless you get anywhere near their little colony. Now, I did mention that we don't have any hive forming or eusocial or, my, um, or mega organism uh, bee species in Florida, but most bee species do exist in some sort of colony with a queen laying eggs, raising daughters to help the colony grow throughout the year. And bumblebees have an annual cycle. Um, a queen wakes up in the winter uh, from her winter sleep and goes out and starts the uh, initial collection of pollen and nectar, uh, grows up a couple of tiny little baby girls who uh, go out and, and then they start doing the work and the queen can focus on laying eggs and increasing the colony size to about maybe 30 individuals uh, by the end of the year. When uh, males and females are produced by the queen, uh, those are sent out into the world to find love and romance and uh, that mated queen that's produced uh, will then overwinter and start the cycle again. Uh, once uh, this year's queen has created those males and females, uh, she kind of quits. Uh, she gives, she retires and the kind of colony structure collapses and the individuals eventually uh, die. So bumblebees are an annual species that completes its life cycle in one year. And they're found, we don't have many species of bumblebee, uh, maybe 12. Uh, they're much more numerous further north where their uh, fuzziness and their ability to overwinter, their hardiness, uh, they can be found as far north as uh, frozen Canada. So those are some of our uh, larger groups of native bees, but there's another group, the flies. I mentioned before that uh, male mosquitoes are pollinators for some of our native orchids. Uh, they're nectivorous, and as are some of these uh, flies. And the hoverfly, flower fly, bee fly, these have several common names. Uh, I think bee fly is probably most apt. You can see it's uh, intentional uh, mimicry of a bee. It's got the same kind of yellow and black marking. It's got a stout abdomen. Um, and it just, you know, intents and purposes looks like a bee. And it's uh, providing some of the same ecological services. Flies, however, do not feed on, uh, do not feed their larva um, pollen the way that the bees do. The way that you can tell these uh, bee mimics is that uh, there's hardly any transition between their thorax, the center section where the leg and the wings are, and their abdomen. They're just kind of, uh, they have no hourglass shape, if you will. Uh, and their eyes are significantly larger than those of bees. But they're nectivorous and they're important pollinators. Um, uh, here's another example of one of these flower flies or bee flies. Um, you can see those enormous eyeballs um, these are probably the male's uh, female horse flies. Uh, you might 
be familiar with horse flies. The females, just like mosquitoes, which are a type of fly, they also feed on blood. Um, so these, uh, the male of the horse fly is actually quite peaceful and nectivorous. I want to finish up with just a couple of really cool pollination syndromes. So ways that plants have uh, evolved to best ensure their uh, pollination. And we'll look first at the milkweed, the genus Asclepius. And here we have the monarch with its, with its milkweed. And we all know that, well, maybe not again, uh, monarch caterpillars feed on the leaves of milkweed. But butterflies are not all that effective at pollinating milkweed. Milkweed flowers are kind of uh, complex. They have uh, some extra structures that aren't found in other flowering plants, uh, including this central kind of barrel shaped structure with little bits attached, those little black dots attached to the side. You see those little black dots there. Um, here you can see the black dot is actually got a little bit of what looks like a tuning fork attached to it or a wishbone attached to it. This is that structure close up and this is a structure called pollinia. So their pollen isn't produced or isn't distributed like dust. You can see the individual pollen grains are in this little suitcase. And what happens when a, uh, when a visitor goes to a milkweed plant, those little structures break off and get stuck to the pollinator's feet uh, just by clambering around on top of the flower. Uh, and so doing, once this, uh, this wasp visits another uh, of the same species, it'll come off. Uh, here's a, here's a, bumblebee, a honeybee that's got those little pollinia stuck to its feet. Now, unfortunately for our little halictid bees, uh, they might not be strong enough to pull those pollinia free from the flower and they might be trapped there. And so uh, having their last nectar meal before they kind of hang out and perish. Uh, here's an extreme close up of that pollinia attached to an insect leg. Another cool pollination syndrome is buzz pollination. And I've got a, an image of a, uh, an electric toothbrush because uh, back in my days of working in botanic gardens, we actually facilitated buzz pollination. In the absence of the native pollinator for a particular tropical plant, we used a, uh, a toothbrush. And again, I've got a little video that's going to show um, buzz pollination in action. And while it's playing, there's going to be some music that I will do my best to kind of... Um, mute so it's not too loud. I won't mute it, but I'll turn it down a little bit and give you a little bit of, um, give you a little bit of narration. And we're just waiting for that video to start. We're going into outer space to get to YouTube and back. And this is why we practice. So buzz pollination, let's go back. And Well, let me just explain what's going on here. Uh, certain species of flowers have anthers that are called porcidal. They're porous. They have pores in them. And the pollen isn't left out in the air like um, it would be in the other species. The flower actually has to be vibrated uh, for the um, pollen to be released. And so this video shows that in action. So here we go. The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. So here's the bumblebee with its vibrating wings. And that vibration is causing the pollen to come raining out of this flower. You can see it's just dumping right on her hind leg. And that's right where she wants it. That's where her pollen basket is. And, but it's the action of the wing, not just the presence of a, of a fuzzy bee that transfers the pollen. And here's a machine, uh, a toothbrush, an electric toothbrush that's vibrating the flower at just the right frequency to get that pollen to release. And you can see it's pouring out of a hole on the, on the tip of that anther structure. Unfortunately for plants, uh, our um, Honeybees are not effective buzz pollinators. So thank you bumblebees for being native and being around uh, because bumblebees are, buzz pollinated plants include uh, blueberries. These are uh, dependent on buzz pollination as are tomatoes. So with that, I'm going to sign off and from this bumblebee a bye-bye and I'm going to ask you all, um, 
to uh, follow the following instructions, and I really appreciate uh, being with you today, and thank you.